Hi everyone, welcome to this uh, Datasite Annual Media Community Meeting 2000, uh, 2023, where we are going to explore in this session the DOI workflow best practices with a, a fantastic panel of three speakers where we are going to explore their uh, insights and their experiences in well, their, their own uh, organizations. So let's begin with some um, housekeeping ground rules. We remind you that you can um, join the discussion on Twitter and Mastodon with the hashtag, hashtag Datasite2023. Uh, we invite you to review the Datasite Code of Conduct, which are going to be on the chat in a moment. Thank you so much. And uh, by the end of the session, we will have uh, we will invite you to fill the survey uh, by the end of this event. It's only two questions, so we will we will appreciate if you can uh, share your insights after this uh, session, so we can improve our on our next events. And we remind you that this is uh, the slides and the recordings of this event will be shared afterwards event in our YouTube um, channel and of, of course in our Senado community meeting. So. With no further, let's um, let's introduce the panelists. Uh, we're going to start um, first with Sarah Studwell, which is uh, who is librarian and product manager uh, from the Office of Scientific and Technological Information from the U.S. Department of Energy. So, Sarah, welcome, and the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Petro. Let me share my screen. Okay. All right, well, hello. Um, as our trailer said, I'm Sarah Studwell, um, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about uh, DOI workflow best practices using PIDs to connect research components through DOI metadata. So a little bit about OSTI. Uh, the Office of Scientific and Technical Information is similar to a library type office for the US Department of Energy. Um, and our mission for the Department of Energy is to advance science and sustain technological creativity by making research and development uh, outputs accessible and useful in the modern science landscape, uh, not only to our research community, but to the general public as well. As part of this, we collect R&D outputs from researchers and labs throughout our, through our corporate ingest system, eLink. We also provide PID services to make these outputs discoverable to a wider audience, facilitating linkages between components like people, awards, organizations, and those research outputs. Um, and to date, we have assigned over 200,000 DOIs through Datasite. And to make these as findable and reusable as possible, we have an amazing curation team that enhances the submitted metadata. And we also provide search tools to make these outputs findable. So PITs provide a number of benefits. Um, one of these is to broaden discovery and access. Um, here is an example of research component linking through persistent identifiers. And I'll say that we are already doing some of this, but we are not doing all of this yet, but this, th these are the goals here. Um, so this is an example, uh, is a data record we have in our collection um, that we've assigned a DOI to. On the left, you can see the robust metadata. It includes the ORCID IDs for the creators or authors of the data set, uh, which we are currently incorporating. Um, the ROARs for both the organization producing the data and the funders, as well as the award DOI, which are pieces of metadata that we want to include. So the right shows how we plan to include related identifiers to connect related research objects. Uh, you can see the original data record reference an article and a piece of software um, and was cited by another data set. So this helps communities to not only find and reuse the data, but also to see the larger research life cycle and understand the impact of this research. Another benefit of these persistent identifiers is helping with analysis and impact assessment. So by using these PIDs, communities can identify these linked components, understand how they are connected, and then use those connections to track and understand the impact of the research. So things like citation analysis and related identifier metrics facilitates impact evaluation through those linked PIDs within the associated metadata. Uh, here are a few screenshots from PIDs at OSCE.gov, um, our website that provides information about persistent identifiers and their uses and then consolidates all of the information about the various PID services we provide. Um, and this shows just some visualization examples from that website. <clears throat> As part of our mission, we do offer these PID services both to the DOE community and to other US government agencies. 
We assign DOIs to data, to software, reports, conference presentations and posters, and awards. Specifically, we assign DOIs to data through our data ID service and to software through DOE code. So we use eLink uh, for the majority of research submissions, but DOE code is our platform for all things software, including the submission of code and its associated metadata. And I'll speak a little bit more about DOE code in a bit. So labs, facilities, or individuals submit metadata to OSTI via the eLink or the DOE code API or UI. And then this metadata describes the object, which is then passed on to DataCite for DOI assignment. And just as DataCite does, we encourage providing as much metadata as possible to increase discoverability, access, re and reuse of the data and that software. So this is our current approach. I'll also be talking about our plans for the future, um, but I'll go through what we are currently doing now. So uh, we already have done some of this work, but there is other work underway to include a lot more metadata. So currently researchers or labs will submit their research outputs or the metadata for uh, those outputs to OSTI. For some of these output types, uh, OSTI will assign a DOI if the object does not already have one. If the object already has a DOI, OSTI will collect that piece of metadata. So additionally, uh, submitters have the option to provide other persistent identifiers, including ORCID IDs, award DOIs, and other related identifiers. The submitted metadata is then put through our enhancement process. So we have a team that will review and curate that metadata. The record is then updated and stored in that original and this new record, this enhanced record, will overwrite the originally submitted metadata. So we also use Scalix, Crossref, and other sources to enhance the metadata when possible. Um, we had previously added related identifiers from some of these external data sources to the submitted data records, but after feedback from our communities, we stopped doing so. So all related identifiers found in the metadata has been added either by the submitter or data creator or when found through manual curation. So this graph is, it illustrates the workflow of DOI assignment for data. So we provide this for the DOE data community and we call this the data ID service, uh, assigning DOIs to DOE funded data objects. Data creators, labs, data stewards will submit that metadata for the data object to eLink including a URL to where that data is hosted. So we are not a data repository. These DOI landing pages, <clears throat> excuse me, these DOI landing pages resolve to the repository uh, where the data is hosted. And we do require that URL to the landing page uh, for DOI assignment. So OSI will assign a DOI based on the prefix for what we call a data client, but that's you know a project, a lab, um, et cetera. So we then assign a suffix, which is an internal OSI identifier number. OSI then sends the metadata to DataCite for DOI registration. So this record would now become available in OSI.gov or DOE Data Explorer, um, with the DOI providing a link back to the landing page where the data is hosted. So furthermore, this example shows when another research object, like a journal article, cites that data, the DOI will also link back to that landing page. <clears throat> Excuse me. We do the same thing for software through DOE code for DOI assignment. Um, as mentioned, DOE code is the software services platform and search tool for DOE funded code. And so just like data, the metadata for the software or code is submitted to OSTI, and then OSTI will send this metadata on to DataCite for DOI registration. One difference here is that OSTI serves as the landing page for that software meaning that the DOI is going to resolve to DOE code where you can find the metadata, um, including versioning information, which you can see in the screenshot on the right. So those covered our current workflows. Um, but like I said, we want to do even more. So to accomplish this, OSI is rebuilding eLink uh, to reflect the current needs, but also to anticipate future requirements. And we gather requirements from across OSTI as well as external communities. One major component of that rebuild is the collection of additional metadata focusing on related identifiers. These are things like ROAR IDs or research organization registry IDs um, in the organization metadata fields and incorporating, uh, collecting, uh, populating ORCID IDs into that submission workflow. <clears throat> we'll be able to send this on to DataCite, providing a more complete picture of that research lifecycle. And this all aligns with our new public access plan as well. 
So the new workflow, when a researcher or lab submits metadata, OSTE will preserve that original metadata record in our data tables. We will then have a separate layer that will allow for the enhancement and also to track provenance. So this second enhanced layer is gonna contain additional metadata that will both systematically and manually curate, uh, including things like version information, ROAR IDs, uh, related identifiers. This record is then going to be evaluated and any additional metadata that can be sent to data site will be included in both the original submissions for DOI registration, as well as any updates to uh, uh, metadata as well. And so lastly, I just want to mention something that I think is very exciting. Um, I mentioned we'll be able to systematically add those ROAR IDs to our records um, through an organization authority that was developed and built in-house. So we've had an internal authority list containing historical names and their synonyms. And we've used this to standardize our organization names, but we're now building off this authority to include even more information. So we've been collecting this for decades. And so now we can include the metadata describing research outputs that includes that organization information, affiliations, research organizations, funding organizations. But this authority doesn't just include ROARs, it has a ton of information about the organization, including other identifiers, geographical information, and aliases. Um, you can see in this example, the list of aliases is quite long, um, probably about 20 or so for uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, um, which is one of our national laboratories. The fact that we have collected and curated all of this, I find very impressive. Um, so when a user submits a record to OSI, the organization names will be standardized, and then OSI can include the organization identifier metadata when assigning DOIs to research components, um, creating that persistent identifier link between the DOI and the organization identifier. So that concludes my presentation. Uh, we're very excited about the work being done to incorporate persistent identifier metadata. Uh, recognize the impact it'll have on the discovery of research and increasing scientific discovery. And I know this is questions, but I think we're holding those till the end. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, now let's proceed with our next speaker, Eugene Barsky from the uh, University of, oh, sorry. Excuse me. Oh, are you seeing what Dean is supposed to see? University of British Columbia. Sorry. Yes, you are seeing your okay. screen. Sorry. Okay. Eugene okay. Barsky, Research Data Management Librarian from the University of British Columbia at Vancouver. Thank you so much, Eugene. Please go ahead. No worries, Arturo. Thanks so much. Uh, and the, I, I, I prefer to present from the browser so I can see the chat uh, flowing. And uh, good to see so many familiar names uh, uh, for folks who have been working for, for a generation now in this area. Thanks so much for joining. Greetings from uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. It's uh, early morning, well, not early, 11 o'clock now. Um, and it's a beautiful, crispy day. I hope you have enjoyed your day wherever you are. And I am not sure if we can maintain the same level of excitement about metadata as Sarah does, uh, but I will try to, to attempt to do that. So my presentation about uh, a specific case study and institution and uh, to explain our case study, I think we, uh, I should better explain what the institution is. So I'm based in Vancouver in Canada. A University of British Columbia is the biggest school in on the West Coast of Canada, the uh, second largest in Canada, more or less. We have 70,000 students. We have 17,000 faculty and staff. We, have a, we get almost a billion dollars in research funding, and we have an annual budget of more than the cities that we allocate it in. So we are a really big school. And as a library, we also are rather a large library. We have more than 300 employees and 80 librarians. We run many systems. It might be familiar for so many of you, but we are a big <laughs> school that we need to take care of our stuff that we produce. As a large library, we run four uh, standalone purpose-built repositories. Uh, we run a Dataverse for, for research data for quite a while. We run DSpace for even longer. We run Atom for, for archival materials. And we have ContentDM for around 1 million digitized objects. 
we um, since we have four various repositories, it makes sense for us uh, to create a, a one discovery interface where our users can see all our content in one place. So we home built it and was released in 2016. Many of you have seen it. They are just recognizing your names from the chat. Uh, we released it open source. It actually powered the, the Canadian beta discovery for, for quite, a, quite a few years as well. Um, so what we do, we take the metadata from the source repositories and we crosswalk it to our common metadata standard, which we have released. The, all the crosswalks are publicly available now on GitHub. Uh, we crosswalk it to one common metadata uh, standard. And from there, we crosswalk it to data site and the schema.org for enhanced discovery. So unlike a, a many other places, we don't mint DOIs in the source repositories. We mint the DOI and the discovery layer. Um, and and they, we, uh, in some cases, we write it back into the source repositories. In some cases, we do not. Like content DM, it doesn't allow you to write it back. We have been doing it for quite a while. I, I have initiated the device minting in 2015, 16. So we minted uh, almost uh, uh, 300, well, actually more than 300,000 devices now. Uh, just this year, we minted 15,000 devices and we maintain them on a weekly basis. And we'll talk about it when we talk about issues with devices. If you do it at, on scale, you have to take uh, you have to take responsibility and maintain the stuff you do. We have a robust API system and we allow community integrations, including a IIIF, uh, into our into our work. And we have seen uh, uh, different community integrations uh, uh, implemented, and it's very cool to see that your work actually uh, can build into something else. For each of our uh, data sets and also uh, any other digital assets, we have a, a landing page, which is a, very useful if you want to expose your uh, digital assets into Google Scholar. Uh, Google Scholar doesn't like to take data, as you know, uh, but you can uh, 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 ship data to Google Scholar if you work with the discovery interface. And they, and they create landing page, or programmatically, obviously, to each of those say, digital assets. We allow data to be downloaded in multiple formats, and metadata is available and from JSON to RDFs to any other formats that the different systems can read. Also, for each digital asset, we have a landing page with a, a statistics and locations enabled, which is really cool to see for some faculty and researchers with, who want to see where, where their uh, research is being looked at and used, especially for data. So uh, some when we implemented this service uh, in uh, around the eight uh, years ago, we have offered it campus wide. We said, okay, we'll start offering UI service for for researchers who need it, and we we learned very quickly within the first few months that the um, it's actually an issue. Many faculty members, so many researchers, reach out to us and ask for for a UI for 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 a brochure, for a, for a piece of software that do not have a persistent URL solution. And as a result, since we signed the license with a data site, the library is responsible for it, we cannot commit to maintaining those because uh, uh, if the URLs change, it's on us to edit all those, say, uh, all those digital items. So we are uh, very cautious nowadays to commit to um, any uh, one-off uh, faculty requests for minting DOIs. Obviously, there are many advantages for us to mint DOIs. We, we get the persistent URLs. Uh, but the most importantly, as, as all of you know, being here, uh, each DOI is not just a persistent URL. It's also a metadata package. And that metadata package uh, is very helpful when we ship information about our digital assets to uh, other partners, like uh, schema.org, like uh, we ship it to all ProQuest products as well. Uh, Salmon, Primo, and so on. And we take a good use of data site APIs and GraphQL uh, for citations. Some things to pay attention to. Uh, 
And I, I know that all of you know that, but this is actually a, a, a painful point. You cannot delete a DUI after minting it. So uh, some, uh, if you work with a discovery system by mistake, uh, some systems, source repositories like uh, content DM create pages that you need to uh, delete later. But since you minted device for those automatically, we have to create thumb stones. So you have to create solutioning for the UI. So we can be, uh, and one thing to remember, you cannot delete them. You can edit them, uh, but you cannot erase them forever, which means maintenance is required for our scale of 300,000 UIs. We do it on a weekly basis. On a weekly basis, we run a report for the UIs that have not been validated and we, we fix those. And as I mentioned, faculty who request device as a service is not a good idea that we really learned it from our own experience. Uh, the data side folks asked me to talk about ROARS in our integration for ROARS. Uh, uh, I was really interested to hear what Sarah has to say uh, before me. So we also, uh, we waited a bit before integrated ROS, but uh, you will all know that ROS is a new, uh, newish standard, replaced grid. We are very excited to be able to play uh, with it and it works well with ORCIDs and UIs. It's non-proprietary, it's open, and that's how we like things to be. So right now at this point of time, if somebody looks for an item uh, from all, sorry, all digital items from the University of British Columbia, they're not able to see it because there's no place we're actually saying um, all items we, that we have are UBC items. ROARS uh, help us to solve that. Uh, if, we, uh, if we implement ROARS, it allows uh, our institution to, to show the scholarly community that all these digital assets are UBC digital assets. So ROARS is an excellent way to expose your collections to anyone who can read the uh, uh, linked data. So what we are going, what we are doing, it's a, it's a work in progress. It's not completed, but it's work in progress. We are implementing ROARS in all a, a, a data site metadata. So all the 300,000 UIs so retrospectively and prospectively, we are adding a, a, a couple of elements into the metadata for data site where we claim that uh, each of those UIs has a, 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 a contributor, UBC, as a hosting institution. And here is our uh, ROAR. So which means uh, any institution can, uh, can use an API and search for a, for a specific ROAR and we'll be able to retrieve our, all our data sets together. And I gave you the specific uh, elements that we are using, but uh, uh, that's more technical uh, question. So I will leave it at that. And I thank you for your time and we'll wait for the questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eugene. Very insightful. And to uh, close this uh, conversation, we have the participation of uh, Rodrigo Donoso Vegas, who is a director from the Directorate of Information Services and Libraries at the University of Chile. Thank you so much for joining, joining us, Rodrigo, and please feel free to share your insights. It's okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Arturo, for the introduction and all participating in this session of Data Site meeting. Uh, it's a pleasure to participate in this activity and to represent the experience that we have developed in the, at the University of Chile. Uh, my presentation with the, uh, will deal with the implementation of integration between information service and service such as DOI and ORCID. Uh, I would like to a context of our university, which is the main educational center in, the, in the Chile, in my country. Uh, we have 47,000 students and 4,000 academic and researchers, uh, 20 faculties and institute in all area of knowledge, and one hospital, an hospital, and five campus in all Santiago of Chile. Uh, our library system has a 45 library, archives, and museum, uh, three types of, of center, 
and 90 librarians. Uh, we also have a bibliographic collection of more than 3 million items and more than 45,000 uh, digital objects that are available in our digital library and complementary service of journal, books, data, uh, among others. Uh, in addition to tradi traditional service, uh, we have the implementation uh, of research support service, specifically to support the need of researchers in relation to research data management, uh, data management plans, open science, uh, among other issues. Uh, in the 2021, the University of Chile began the, to lead the Chilean Data Site Consortium and start to promote uh, its infrastructure and product. Previously, uh, we have developed the first data repository, repository in Chile. In 2023, uh, we already have six members to have also been implementing their own own digital infrastructure and using data site service. As consortium leaders, we provide support in the fabrica and the integration with different system, mainly dataverse. And the university uh, has been a member of ORSI since to, uh, 2023. <clears throat> At the university, uh, we have a, an ecosystem of information service, which inclo include from left to the right on the screen, an academic repository, a digital library, we use uh, Primo and Alma, a journal portal uh, developed in OGS, a PKP product, a book portal, a OMP Open Monograph Press, PKP product two, uh, research data in database, uh, database software, and other regional service like a, a Latin American uh, repository network. Specifically in the academic repository service, which include uh, mainly thesis and research article, the book portal, the red screen, the red uh, image, uh, include open access books, the journal portal, and the portal data, data portal, generate DOI from the data site fabrica and are immediately uh, available in the data commons using data site metadata standards. Uh, for example, in the books portal developed in Open Monograph Press, a uh, PKP product, from this platform, we automate the DOI management via APA. Uh, for example, uh, in, in this screen, you can see that we uh, click on the title and directly uh, send the information to data site with all metadata uh, to data site. Uh, the visibility uh, that our book now have is very high send the incorporation to the, this book to the uh, global infra infrastructure. Uh, in, another, in another example, the data repository, uh, we include ORCID in the metadata, uh, allow us to link with local and global service to give greater, greater uh, visibility to our research. In the image, in the image you can see the data the data model that integrate the, integrate the service. And if we can zoom in, you can see the importance, the, um, the identifiers such as DOIS, or SID or ROR to link with academic service such as CRIS system. Uh, to promote it, this infrastructure, it's necessary to promote the use of a persistent ID, specifically in the case of in the case of ORCID, uh, we are detecting users who already have ORCID, but we have not associated uh, their affiliation to the university. Uh, we also give support to academic to create 
uh, or improve their profile, uh, considering that the information will reach local system via APA or another uh, integration. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Arturo. Thank you so much, Rodrigo, Sara, Eugene. Uh, it has been really interesting to see how uh, you have been working within your institutions to implement these workflows. I think, uh, well, there are fantastic examples of best practices, and I am sure that the audience will be really interesting to know more or have been at least uh, taking some insights of your presentations. Uh, we remind you that uh, we have some time to, to solve some questions that you may have for the presenters on, on today's session. So we invite you to use the Q&A button to, to well, perform or to make your questions. We have uh, received a couple of them. Some of them have been already answered. Thank you so much. Uh, for, for, for the interest and for the, being so active. Maybe we can start um, with within what we have seen during your presentations. I would like to ask you um, what has been the main challenge or, or what you consider the main challenge that you have faced in your position to implement these workflows within your community? I don't know if you would like to start, Sara. Sure. Uh, for us, for us, uh... At the, or the U.S. Department of Energy, we serve all 17 of the national labs, and that it you know covers a very diverse range of research um, and types of research. Um, and so, kind of interacting with all of those communities, and especially as we start to or start to or we are rebuilding eLink, um, gathering you know their needs and their requirements, and making the the submission process as streamlined and um, as user-friendly as possible um, so that there are lower barriers to them either submitting um, the, the the related identifier or persistent identifier information or you know in our case you know we're going to be systematically adding those rules so just taking that completely out of their hands they don't even need to worry about it um, so that has been a, a, a big priority. And I know our development team um, has done a lot of work um, to make that possible. Thank you so much. Uh, Eugene, would you like to? Sure. Thanks, Antonio. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, this is a, I, will, I will focus on three challenges. Uh, one is a, a, something to be aware of. It, none of the UI services, although propri not proprietary and, and open, are easily and free. So it takes energy and finance and money to commit to maintain and do this work, not in terms of paying the cost of a, of a, a annual license, which is also has a cost, uh, but also uh, it's mostly about the uh, time mm -hmm. we need to spend uh, as developers and as a, a, a as a data analyst to, to to do this work. It is not a super easy piece of work. Uh, two is explaining the value to to our administrators. Uh, administrators do not necessarily understand or have to understand the value of PIDs and infrastructure and how the PIDs can live together and improve. Some countries have done excellent work in this area, in Australia and England, they have national initiatives. We have it too in Canada, but it's ongoing. It's not this, it's happening slower. Um, many administrators don't understand it and they, we have to package and sell it to them. And three, right now, as it's at this point of time, a, a, uh, there are many holes in the system in terms of uh, uh, PIDs working together. Uh, it is not a perfect solution yet. It's more, more like a sieve. And we try to solve some problems, but we, don't, we, we, we are far away from making this uh, a smooth integration between all PIDs working together. But I will leave it at that. Thanks, Arturo. Thank you so much. Um, Rodrigo, would you like to to share the, the challenges yes. that your organization has faced? Okay, yes, I think that the main challenge uh, for our institution is to promote the use of uh, identi identifiers of, or PID uh, to work on standardization. Uh, in our case, not all researchers are aware of the importance of identifiers. 
also develop an, an adequate and standard-based infrastructure. infrastructure. Uh, and in addition to being able to count on trained professionals, uh, mainly in, in Latin America. Fantastic. We have one question from, from Sherry, uh, which is directly for, for Eugene. Uh, it's asking, are you generating DOIs for all data sets from the Dataverse side? Uh, if so, why not just mint the DOIs via Dataverse? Or are you sending more metadata to data site when minting DOIs through the custom interface? I was typing the answer, Arturo, but <laughs> I will stop typing, stop typing and answer it. Uh, uh, hi, Sherry. Good, so to, good to hear from you as usual. Uh, the, uh, so I said there are four source repositories. Uh, similarly to what the Rodrigo is mentioning, he mentioned Dataverse. I think they run it too. Yes, we, we mean DOIs in the... Okay, I'm going to be controversial here, and I was told not to. Uh, so I will be gently controversial. We mean DOIs in Dataverse uh, because we have to. It's built in. Uh, uh, our only choice is handles on DOIs. We mean handles in one of our dataverses, the co-licensed data. We mean DOIs in the, in the second dataverse, which is a research data dataverse. So we mean DOIs. It's built in. You can't avoid it. When we import those metadata records into our discovery system, we mean another one, another DOI, uh, because that's how we build the system. What we do at, at, the, at that point of time, when we have duplicates, we, uh, uh, we have piece of work that submits uh, 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 to data side that two, those two DOIs are identical. Uh, we're actually claiming those two DOIs are identical and uh, it's for citation purposes. Why we are doing it, why we are creating it to ourselves, is because we build the system way before everything, uh, all those, uh, uh, all the source repositories feeds were introduced. When we started to work with the open collections, it's just a legacy issue. Um, Dataverse was not working with device, it was working with handles only. And that would, it made sense for us. And so we have to, it's a legacy problem that we are we, we, we living with. Uh, it's a long answer, but uh, I wish it would be easier for us to do. Fortunately, data site Skiba, the 4.5 now, allows you to claim that DOIs are, are, are identical. And it's very helpful and I'm thankful for that. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, one question that we also, oh, there is one a particular question uh, that is asking uh, to Eugene, can you edit DOI metadata in Dataverse once they have created it? So, um, Technical question, <laughs> as you as another one. So, once the metadata in Dataverse is created and 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 the sub submitted to uh, to data site, um, that's the Dataverse DOI metadata. The whatever is, is submitted. I don't remember how many elements. I think only the mandatory elements are submitted on the Dataverse end. No more than six. Uh, the mandatory elements. So that's what's submitted to 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 um, to uh, data site. When we take that item into our homegrown open collection interface, we 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 mint uh, another UI with a bit more metadata, including raw, <laughs> uh, because the uh, dataverse does not have raw built in at this point of time. Even the ORCID integration is not superb in any way. ORCID integration and data, we are, we are talking about systems here. ORCID integration and Dataverse is not there yet. It's not, it's not very good. Uh, it will be better eventually, but uh, right now it's not. So, um, so we're actually enhancing those, uh, uh, those metadata records in open collections. And we, again, claiming that those UIs uh, are the same, identical. But that's just how a one institution, it's not perfect in any way. Uh, that's why I said the, 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 the ecosystem right now is full of issues. Uh, but the, I'm, I'm hopeful uh, uh, that as we work through those issues, we are going to make them better. Uh, and uh, we are aware of those issues and uh, it's the first step for resolving them properly. Thanks again. Thank you. Um, um, more general question. Um, for 
especially for 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 organizations who are starting their path in in this implementation of workflows do you have any suggestions for for those who are uh well starting uh, on this path and may uh may face some of these uh, challenges that you have uh, also expressed here do you have any suggestions on on how to how to proceed and how to uh document themselves or how, how to proceed when they are starting the, their path in implementation of these kind of workflow workflows um within their communities I don't know if um, maybe um, Eugene or Sarah. Ah, sorry. I can go ahead. Uh, I, yeah. I guess it kind of depends on um, the workflow, uh, especially you know incorporating you know persistent identifiers or this related uh, identifier metadata. If you are relying on the submitter um, to provide that 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 information, I mean, you know, we all know that especially with researchers and things like that, there's that, that researcher burden and, you know, just getting the basic metadata is sometimes hard enough. So education, um, kind of like what Rodrigo was saying, you know, uh, education on the front end, why it's important to include your ORCID ID, why um, it might be important to include their wars or yeah, uh, the related identifiers. It's, it, you know, you, you've done all this research, you've done all this work, these things help increase discoverability. And so um, maybe the education aspect from that end, and then at least from our, from our uh, case, use case, I guess would be, um, because we are having, you know, relying on the submissions, but then automating what you can kind of taking, taking um, it, it off of your submitters. So incorporating the, uh, the collection of that ORCID ID on submission or systematically pulling uh, related identifiers, persistent identifiers, uh, whenever possible. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, maybe uh, Eugene, would you like to share for, for I, I think I'll leave it to Rodrigo. Rodrigo uh, is a, definitely has a different perspective than I spoke enough. R Rodrigo, would you like to? Okay, yes. Uh, I agree that that the it's important to train the inter the internal team the internal staff uh, to raise the awareness and and consciences to the important uh, bit um, and also the user the user uh, need to to train about the uh, about the orchid about the role about the eventually the the next integration, the disinformation with other systems, like a Chris, like a, a metadata is, is only one start point, but the disinformation is in another system. And yes, this is important, important uh, issue. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um... I don't know if we have any additional open questions. I think all the questions have been answered yet. So um, if you agree, we, we, we can wrap wrap it up uh, for today. Thank you so much for for to all the attendees. Thank you so much for keeping uh, keeping up with us. We there have been many hours of sessions, but uh, uh, I really, really appreciate that you have made the effort to join us during the whole sessions. And of course, uh, a huge thanks and, and congratulations and thank you for uh, our speakers today. I think uh, we have seen fantastic uh, presentations and I am sure that these best practices uh, can develop to further discussion in, in the future. So thank you so much for, for opening the door for, for these questions in, in, in the future. Thank you so much uh, and well, uh, we'll see you on the next session. Thank you. Thank you.